So this is a little scary for me this morning because I'm up here doing something I said I would never do. I know. I don't listen to myself very well. I'm going to talk to you about the end of times, and I'm going to talk to you about a study, a very fascinating Christian study called eschatology. And eschatology is a study that looks into the Bible to try to determine the final destiny of the human soul. And under that umbrella of eschatology is another study, Christian study, called Killiism. And the goal of these two studies together combined is again to just answer the questions we have about the end of time by studying and interpreting God's word. And uh, they're not very popular studies, but I happen to love them both and have dived into them over the years. And I want to tell you some interesting findings that, uh, that they teach us this morning, and I think you might uh, find this very interesting when I get done. Kiliists believe that the model God used in creating the heavens, I'm going to kind of go a little slower because there's a lot of information I'm going to fill you up with first and then I'm going to tell you the results of the information. So um, if I take a couple minutes longer than I should, just bear with me, but I want you need to really understand what's going on. Kilius believed the model that God used in creating the earth will be the same model he's going to use to deal with mankind and with sin. You see, the word Kiliism comes from the Greek word for millennial, which means a period of a thousand years. And God created the heavens and the earth in six days, right, and rested on the seventh day. So Kiliists believe that God will use the same model with dealing with mankind, with dealing with you and I and all our sins, that he will only strive with mankind for not for six days, but for 6,000 years, because again, Kilius believe a day and a thousand years to the Lord are the same, that God will only strive with mankind for 6,000 years, then he'll rest on that 7,000 year with men. Now, what's that 7,000 year called? The millennial, right? That's the millennial when after the rapture and after the battle of Armageddon, then we come to the thousand year period that reign, uh, Christ reigns on earth, and then we have the great white throne judgment. So you can see it on our timeline up here, over here. Creation, 6,000 years, the rapture of the church, 1,000 years, and then the great white throne judgment. And then after that we have, God destroys the heavens and the earth, creates a brand new heaven and the earth, and we all live on that. Got it so far? And the apostle of Peter, and it's interesting that a lot of the Old Testament uh, men in the Old Testament, and even the apostles, believed in Kiliism. This was a, a, a very uh, common belief in the Old Testament and in the early part of the New Testament. Peter said this in Peter 2, uh, 3, uh, 2 Peter 3, 8, he said, but beloved, do not be ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So again, God will use that same model. He'll rank, he'll deal with sin for a thousand years and then he'll, uh, six thousand years and he'll reign for a thousand years. And the Old Testament uh, person, people in the Old Testament, the patriarchs and the, and the believers, and the New Testament believers, Jews in the New Testament, felt that they, uh, the same thing that we believe in, in the sense they believe that the Jews would form a spiritual, single spiritual body with a single inheritance and that they would be God's people. Well, today we do the same thing, right? Who, who's that? Who's that today? Us, the church. We're a single body now, and not in God, in Christ Jesus, and we have a single inheritance, which is what? Eternal life with Jesus. So we believe the same things that they believed, or they believe the same things that we believe, but they substituted God for Jesus because Jesus hadn't been here at that time. Then this... This belief remained quite popular until about 300 AD. So for the first 300 years or so, almost 300 years of Christianity, the, the new believers, the apostles, and a lot of the new believers believed this Kiliism belief had come from the Old Testament, but it had come into the New Testament. Now, at about 300 AD, it went away. Why? Because the church aligned itself with Rome. Remember that? The church aligned itself with the Roman government and Constantine said, oh boy, uh, 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 Christianity now is vogue. 
This is vogue, go out, yeah, everybody become a Christian. And when they did, they brought in a lot of ideas and a lot of things from the Roman Empire and ideas that they had and a lot of things that were, that were old beliefs to the uh, old prophets in the, in the Bible and the old people in the Old Testament, they went away. And one of the things that happened was around this time, 300 AD, Roman philosophy was on the rise and they were philosophical thinkers and, and they didn't believe in a resurrection of the flesh. The Romans said, no, I don't want to be resurrected in the flesh. My body's going to go in the grave. It's going to rot. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I want to be resurrected in the spirit. And they only believed in a resurrection in the spirit. In the spirit. And that's Roman writers and Roman Christians and Roman theologians and the theologians, and they all believed in this. And they thought that the one year reign, the 1,000 year reign of Christ on the earth was going to be a spiritual reign. Get it? Not a physical reign. You and I are going to come back in our bodies. We're going to be raptured. We're going to have brand new bodies on the way to heaven. We're going to come back with Jesus when we come back and reign on earth with our brand new glorified bodies. But they said, no, it's a spiritual resurrection and not a physical resurrection. So what they said was, okay, so what we're going to do then is we're going to say that Christ is, is um, reigning right now. You see, back in that early first 1,000 years, we're going to say that Christ is reigning on earth right now. And they came up with this belief of what we call it a millennialism, which means the millennial has already happened. And so what they believe, these people, is that the book of, of, of Revelation took place in the first 1,000 years, you see? And, not, and so now Revelation is isn't, isn't a prophecy anymore, it's a history, okay? But if you remember our... our uh, our uh, history and your Bible studies, you'll understand that John and Paul both had to deal with these Greek uh, presuppositions about all this. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote the entire 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians defending the physical resurrection of the flesh. He wrote the entire 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians saying no. And this is back then when everybody was believing in a spiritual resurrection. He was writing, no, you're wrong. It's, it's, a, it's a physical resurrection. It's not a spiritual one. And then Peter said this again. Let's look at this again. 2 Peter 3.8. It says, Beloved, do not be ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, how many times have you started a sentence to somebody that you know by saying, don't be ignorant? Probably never. You would never start a sentence like that, unless what? You were really ignorant. Unless, unless he was really arguing with the people of that time and saying, don't be ignorant. One year is a thousand years. One day is like a thousand years to our Lord and a thousand years is like one day. Don't be ignorant of this fact. We will have a physical resurrection and it will be a thousand year reign of Christ on earth. So you can see where the, where the people in the Old Testament and in the New Testament continued to fight this thing about uh, spiritual versus uh, physical resurrection. So let's work on this. One thing we have to do is we have to look at this, um, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day and we have to blend it into the Bible, don't we? Because if it doesn't match what's wrong, it's wrong. So one year has to be like a thousand years and a thousand years has to be like a day and it can't clash with anything in the Bible. As a matter of fact, it should make things clearer when you stop and think about it. You, have, you might have some questions about it and here's one of them. Here's one of them. Let me look at this here. The Genesis 2.17. This is always kind of, I've always kind of wondered about this. It says, this is Adam and Eve, all right? And they were in the garden and God said to them, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat in it. For in the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Did they die when they ate the apple? No. They didn't, at least not a physical death anyway. I mean, they didn't die as far as what I was thinking <laughs> what, 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 what death would be, what I considered a death to be. And all my life, people have explained it to me by saying, oh, no, 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 what this means is a, uh, is a spiritual death. It means that they would lose the Holy Spirit. Well, I mean, you know, okay, that, that could be. That, that could, I guess it could be. Um, I've even been told that the word death uh, in almost any language means separation. And so that's what God means. When, when, when that the day you eat of this apple, you'll be separated. And that, of course, happened, didn't it? Because death means separation. So what were they separated from? They were separated from God. 
They were separated from one another because they were naked and ashamed. Uh, they were separated from their relationship with Jesus. Um, they were separated from the garden. Uh, there's a lot of things they were separated from, so, so it could mean that too. Um, but when Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, he used that word many, many times. And the book was inspired by God. God really wrote that book through Moses. And it says death and it says die. And when Moses used that same word, it meant physical death. So how do we, how do we make that right? How can we say that they died both spiritually perhaps, or they were separated perhaps, but they also died physically on that day? Well, here's a secret. This might help. Look at that verse again. It says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt eat not of it for what? In the day that thou eat thereof, you will surely die. Not on the day, but in the day. Now that makes a difference, doesn't it? it makes a huge difference. And to the Lord of a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. Then they didn't live but only that one day, did they? Because how, how old was Adam when he died? 930 years old. And how old was Methuselah when he died? 969 years old. So there hasn't been a person that lived since that day longer than the day they were born in the eyes of the Lord. You see what I'm saying? You see how that, does that, and that kind of clarifies that, that uh, verse a little bit, doesn't it? Kind of makes you think about it anyway. And that's just one example of Kiliism. I just don't have enough time. I, I, there's a hundred examples in the Bible like this that show you this. I just use that one because I want you to just be aware of nowhere in the Bible do we find where this belief clashes with anything. So then our next question would be, if God's only going to strive with mankind from 6, year, for 6,000 years, where are we on that 6,000 year timeline? Where do we stand now if that's the case? Um, how far along are we and how close are we to the rapture of the church? And the answer uh, is through this study and what I've studied is we're wonderfully, marvelously, amazingly close. We're very, very, very close according to this study. And we learn a lot about this timeline through the Bible. No, actually, we learn everything about this timeline in the Bible, not from man. This timeline I'm going to give you is taken right from the Bible. Uh, let's look at Genesis 5, 3, 6. It says, when Adam had, now this is the genealogy, and the genealogy, if you ever read the genealogy in the Bible, it starts with Adam and Eve, and it goes all the way up to Noah. Okay, so, and we know when Noah was born. We have the clear Jewish records of when Noah was born. And so in the Bible, here's what it says. I'm just giving you this little example so you'll see how it reads, and you can go home and read it later on. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son on his own, in his own likeness according to his image and named him Seth. Then the days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he fathered another, other sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Now Seth lived 105 years old, and he fathered Enosh. What it is, is that again, and it keeps going on, and now, now Enosh lived so long, and Seth lived so long, and they had children, and they lived so long, and they lived so long, and they lived so long, until you get all the way up to Noah, that we know when Noah was born. And so if you look at when Noah was born, and you run that genealogy backwards, you can kind of get an idea of, according to the Bible, when creation happened, when it took place. And there was a guy in the 1600s named uh, Bishop Usher. Have you ever heard of him? Bishop Usher, look him up, U-S-H-E-R. And he took this genealogy, he took the knowledge that we just, I just told you about, about Noah, and he went back and he went back and he went back all the way and followed this gene genealogy backwards. And he came up with a date of 4004 B.C. And if you go look in that Bible in the back of the church over by my uh, desk and by that chair, it's, it's an old Bible, it's, a, it's an uh, old picture Bible, and it's quite an old Bible, it's maybe 75, 80 years old. And if you open up to Genesis 1.1, and it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and on the margins, it says 4004 BC in the margins. 
And so this is something that's been known for a long, long time, that according to the Bible, that's when creation took place. And so we must be pretty close um, to that date, um, except we missed it, didn't we? We missed the 6,000 years because if we added 4,004 and 2022, what did we come up with? 26,026. Missed the rapture by 26 years. <laughs> well, maybe not because that's man's figuring. That, that timeline was given to us from a man. Now let's get the timeline that the Bible gets, gives us and let's see if there's a difference. Okay, I'm gonna read this to you. Go to Genesis 6.1. Now it came about when mankind began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whoever they chose. And then the Lord said, my spirit will not remain with man forever because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. Write that down, 120 years, that's important. This is the time of the flood. This is the time of the flood and the, and the sin was so rampant on the earth that God said, I can't take any more of this sin. Man is nothing but evil, uh, nothing but vile, and I'm going to just destroy and wipe out the entire earth. And from now on, or he said, I will only deal with man for 120 years. Okay. <coughs> Let's look at verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind and they bore children and they were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. So the Lord was sorry that he made mankind on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will wipe out mankind who I have created from the face of the land, mankind and animals as well, and crawling things and the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. And then came the flood, and everything was wiped out except for Noah and his wife and his three sons and their three wives, except for eight people. I'm only gonna strive with man for 120 years. What does that mean? Did it mean that a hundred and he's only gonna, after the flood was over, that he was only gonna strive for man for another 120 years? No, no, that doesn't sound right because time went on after that. That's, the flood was thousands of years ago, so that couldn't be right. Did it mean that perhaps man would only live a lifetime of up to 120 years and that he would, that was it. I mean, we'd only live to be 120 years old and that, and that would be it. Well, that one can't be right because after the flood, the patriarchs, some of the patriarchs lived to be 850 years old. So after the flood, the patriarch line still continued at least for another couple thousand years until Abraham was born and Abraham himself lived to be 175 years old. So that can't be it. What did he mean by 120 years? And I guess what we have to do here is figure out something that's going on here that's, that's either our Bible is wrong or we're wrong. And let's look at that verse again, 6.3. The Lord said, my spirit will not strive with man forever because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days will be 120 years. The definitive, definitive article in that uh, verse is man. And so man, of course, uh, in the Bible is Adam. That's Adam's name, means man, that's what it means. And so he's talking about, God is specifically talking about mankind, not one individual person, but mankind as a whole, 120 years. And at that time that this was written, the people only knew two years. They knew a lunar year, and that was the cycle of the moon going around the earth and waxing and waning over the months. And they determined the Jews had that year and that's how they kept time for quite some time. As a matter of fact, the United States didn't turn over to that, to solar leaders until like the 1700s when we had to catch up and, add a, and, and take away a few days. So, but it can't be lunar years because that still would average just about 120. So what does it mean? Well, have you ever heard of the Jubilee in the Bible? Have you ever heard of that, the Jubilee? Look at Leviticus chapter 25, starting in verse eight. 
Two years the Jews would have known, lunar year and jubilee year. Those are the only two years they would have known. You are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, so that you have the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, that is 49 years. So you are to take seven years, times seven years, and that's 49 years. What you're supposed to do is, let me read this to you. You shall then sound a ram's horn on the 10th day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. That's the day when uh, the priests came together and they forgave all sins through atonement and through sacrifice. You shall sound a horn to all the land and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his family. You shall have a 50th year as a jubilee, and now, and you shall have, underline that in your Bibles, a 50th year as what? The jubilee year. And shall not sow or harvest its aftergrowth, nor grapes from its untrimmed vines, for it is a jubilee, it shall be holy to you, you shall eat its produce from the field on this year of Jubilee. Each of you shall return to his property. So you take your fields and you plant them for six years. You let them rest on the seventh. It retains their vitality and it gets the minerals back into the soil. And during that year, anyone who's poor could come through your fields and glean them, and take food from them, any crops that did come up. And you were to do that seven times until you got to 49 years. And then when you got to 49 years, you were supposed to just let your field rest one more year. And that was called a jubilee. So what would happen now, you might want to take a pen out, write this down, 120 years that God is going to deal with mankind times 50 equals what? 6,000 years. Right? 150 years times, 120 years, I'm sorry, times this 50 years is 6,000 years. So, all we need to do now is to find out where we are in the Jubilee period, right? And here's what we know. Here's exactly what we know so far. From uh, Jewish history and Jewish, uh, the, the, the uh, priests, the Jewish priests, and from their history and from their Bibles, from their books, we know that Noah and Abraham died Noah died and Abraham was born in the 40th Jubilee. From the time that the Jews, this order was given, Leviticus, until the time that the Jews were given that order, until the time that Noah died and Abraham was born was 40 Jubilees. And then when we go back to Jewish history, we know that from Exodus to Solomon were 10 Jubilees, from Solomon to Cyrus, and from Cyrus to the crucifixion, and from the crucifixion to today, what Jubilee do you think we're in? 50th Jubilee. We are in on the Jewish calendar, the 50th Jubilee. So if God said he's only going to strive with man for 120 years, and Kilius believed he's only going to strive with mankind for 6,000 years, where are we in that 50th year? Well, let me, uh, let me tell you this. Someone wrote a few years ago about this. I'll give you his name and I'll give you the book. And he said, this is what you can expect during the last 50 years. This is what the world can expect during the last 50 years, this last jubilee. He said, the final kingdom on earth will not necessarily engage itself by force. Instead, it will slowly engage itself into building an agenda. And that agenda will have to be a utopian fantasy in the guise of democracy if it's going to succeed. So we, the United States and America, he said, can expect the emergency of a socialist, a socialist democratic government that will continue to increase its persecution of the church and its beliefs and morals upon people. That was written well, some, quite some time ago about this last jubilee and how it would affect us. 
He said the orders will strive to turn the Christian faith upside down and scatter the church until all this comes to fruition. And this sounds about right. It sounds about like this is happening today. Please write this down if you're interested. The name of this gentleman who wrote this is Tim Warner, W-A-R-N-E-R. And the book that he wrote is called The End of Time. And it's a fascinating read and I think you'd really enjoy it. Tim Warner, The End of Time. So my final question then is where are we in that last 50 years? Where are we in that last 50 years? Well, you ready for this? Now I'm not prophesizing this because I'm not going to jail. <laughs> And I'm not, I'm telling you this is a fascinating, fun study. And if, it, and if it's something that you like, that's interesting. Go look it up and play with it. But, I, but nobody knows. The only thing that we know is God said we'll never know the exact time, but we will know the season. He did say we'll know the season. This is, again, is a study that's thousands of years old. And I'm just telling you what this study says. And uh, like I said, I love just studying this study because it kind of opens your mind. But here we go. Ready? The 50th Jubilee will end on October 1st, 2020, 2036. October 1st, 2036, which is also what? The Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, the day when everybody will come together and sins will be forgiven. And if it's true, if that's true, and we believe in a pre-trib rapture, right? Because this talks about the final battle of Armageddon when Christ will then take over his thousand year reign on earth. If that's true, we have to come back seven years because if we believe the church is raptured during the pre-trib period, some people think the church will go and then the rapture, uh, the tribulation will start. Other people think the church won't be raptured until the middle of the tribulation and other people think right at the end. I think the church will be raptured at the beginning of the tribulation because we're his bride and what husband would want his bride to live through that time period. And so if that's the case, then we can take uh, seven years from that, and that would be in October, well, sometime in October, but of 2029, sometime in 2029. Isn't that interesting? Yes. It's only a study. <laughs> It's only a study. It's only a good book to read. Um, it's called The End of Times by Tim Warner. And, and who knows? I mean, who knows? But I just think it's a fascinating study. And I wasn't going to teach it, but uh, I, have I, 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 I wasn't going to teach it here in the church, but I taught it at home in our small group lessons and stuff, and we had fun with it. So I thought maybe you'd have fun with it too. But anyway, it's a great study. And uh, oh, by the way, sweet dreams tonight.